2017 CF 15684, State B. Nelson, back from our recess. Ms. Simmons, is defense ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Nelson? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Nelson, it's safe? Yes, Judge. Mr. James Nelson, are you ready for us to bring in the jury, sir? Yes, Your Honor. All right, please bring in the jury. <clears throat> Ms. Simmons, does the defense acknowledge the jury? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Nelson? Yeah, oh, yes, Your Honor. Mr. Nelson, state? We do. All right, Ms. Simmons, please continue. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Nelson, we were talking about the last photo that I had emailed you. It's um, yes. It's marked. It's marked as a K for identification. And mm -hmm. can you tell us what this photo is of? It's a picture of my mother and my brother Scott. And uh, it was probably. I'm sure it was taken in hooks. It. Okay, so Scott would have been around 10, 11. Yes, that's correct. All right, and at this time, Your Honor, we would move what's been previously marked for identification as K into evidence's defense or? No objection. Without objection, what's been marked for identification as defense K is admitted in evidence as defense exhibit four. Thank you. Okay, and you, you started talking about how um, Scott became like an emotional support for your mother during that time in the trailer? Yes, that's true, yes. And um, was, your yeah. ever, was your mother ever hospitalized in a psychiatric hospital again during this time? No, she was not. Okay. Uh, following, following the divorce, she was never hospitalized again. Okay, but I wanna talk about her mental health issues later on that you noticed, okay? So, um, can you tell me, give me a, an example of things that you witnessed um, that, that were symptoms of your mother's mental illness? Objection to lack of foundation. Sustain the objection. Did you ever witness uh, your mother acting strange or paranoid? Um, lack of knowledge and also we need a time frame. I will rule the objection. Okay, you can answer that and let me know if you need me to repeat it. Uh, yes, at uh, various things at various times. Um, at one point, my mother was living in an apartment and adjacent uh, to her apartment, there was a uh, maintenance closet. And she started hearing noises in there, which I don't know, could have been machinery or something, but she felt someone was living in there at the time, and she became very concerned about that. Uh, she Did would she assume something. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you said she thought someone was living in there. Did she think that she was being spied on? Yes, she did. That was a concern of hers, that uh, people, people were watching her, yes. And was that an, a similar issue as another apartment where she thought people were spying on her in the bathroom? Yes. Uh, Can you tell me about well, that? Well, actually, actually, I'm sorry. Actually, that's the same apartment. Oh, okay. Can you tell me about yeah. that issue with the thinking that people... Yes, yeah, she would leave... She would leave the bathroom light off all the time um, because she thought people could see in her bathroom, although it was a bathroom that had no window in it. Uh, she thought somehow uh, whether well, they had a camera or what, she was being observed in there. Uh, so she did not spend much time in there. Um, for instance, if she was going to put makeup on or something, she would do it in another room. She wouldn't do it in there, and uh, again, the lights were always off. Okay. And was, uh, there, was there another apartment where she had an issue with the woman who lived downstairs? Uh, yes. Uh, she thought that the woman who lived in an apartment down below her uh, was talking about her and trying to cause problems for her, and... Uh, 
she would wait until the woman would go to leave her apartment. And my mother would go and take the rug in front of her door to the entrance to her apartment. And she would shake it over the hallway banister so dust and whatever would fall on top of the woman's head when she went to go out. And my mother started leaving notes about the woman on uh, her own doorway and then and explaining to, and was explained that the woman was in trouble. Go ahead. I'm sorry. This is the delay. It's the delay. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to ask about the issue. Um, there was an issue with ants at one apartment. Yeah, one apartment she had, she started having ants going into her apartment. And she thought that uh, the woman that lived in the apartment below her had somehow trained the ants to go up the stairs and to go into her apartment. Um, I <laughs> and one time she, uh, in her apartment, she had me come in, go in her bathroom. She goes, look at this. And she had six bars of soap next to the tub. And she said, I never bought this. I've never used this kind of soap. And the fact is, she never had either. But they were there. And um, But she had a woman that would come and help her sometimes do a little bit of shopping for her. So I said, maybe she bought them and left them there. And my mother insisted that there was no way that that happened. But Did you often try to, um, I guess, come up with a rational explanation for her paranoid? Delusion? Yeah. Rather than going along with it, I would try to explain to her, you know, the likelihood for instance, that the woman that helped her out sometimes, perhaps she had purchased the uh, soap. Or when she thought there was a man living in the maintenance closet next to her, that maybe it was just machinery clicking off and on or something. But she was not willing to listen to that at all. And uh, either she would disagree with you or sometimes she would start to get angry because you weren't believing her. Um, you know almost insisting that you were telling her that she was making these things up. And would um, she tend to, like, find proof of her delusions everywhere? Yes. Oh, yeah. She'd say, um, oh, look at that person's looking at me. And part of the, part of the problem is it was an undercover uh, walkway in one of the apartment buildings that she lived. And some of the, uh, they tended to be elderly people. They would sit out in front of their doors in chairs and they would converse and stuff. And I'm sure some of them, you know, gossiped about people. I mean, lots of people do that. But my mother would complain that they were always talking about her. And the fact that she, the way she would act regarding them probably did make them talk more about her, which would exacerbate the whole problem. Can you tell me what that was like for you dealing with these issues that she was having? Well, the, there was no way you could explain it to her that she was going to accept. And it was a constant almost uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Nelson, day. breaking up a little bit, so if we could just pause for a minute. Um, can you start that sentence? Well, yes, can you start that sentence over again? Um, you would try to explain to her why these things could possibly be happening, but she wasn't willing to accept it. And sometimes you would get the feeling that maybe she was thinking that you were in on whatever the problem was, that you had more knowledge about it, that perhaps you knew there was a man living in that closet. Um, There was just really, like, no explaining to her that would be satisfactory to her. Um, okay. But, again, I, I would not invest in what the, the 
her problems or beliefs were. I would just stay adamant about, you know, this is not the case, but. And, but what was that like for you to deal with? Well, it was really difficult. I mean, she's your mother, you love her. I mean, all her sons loved her despite her uh, mental problems. Uh, she was a very, very good woman. She never drank, she never took drugs. Uh, everybody liked her. She had a wonderful sense of humor. Um, was it? But she had, um, sometimes it was very, very overwhelming. Um, I couldn't. I couldn't take it, and sometimes I would just, when I would visit her, I'd have to go, well, I've got to go now. I just couldn't stand it anymore. So in regards to when Scott was living with her, particularly in the trailer, I, I don't know how he dealt with it. Uh, you know, he, he was a kid, and the stuff just went on and on and on. And uh, when she worked, she went to work and managed not to have many problems there, but you know, at the same time, she'd be at work and she worked full time. You know, Scott himself, he'd be there alone in the morning when she left and he'd be alone till she got home in the evening. So I want to um, ask you a little bit about the things that your mother. It's been mentioned that your mother would do antagonistic things to Larry when they were still together. Do you recall any of that? Um, yeah, they. <laughs> It was sort of like it became um, a thing to get my father upset or to bother him or get back at him for things he had done. Um, when it was discovered or understood that uh, he was having an affair with the woman that he would later marry, uh, she was aware and did not object to the fact that uh, Sugar was taken and poured in his gas tank to ruin his car. Um, he had a item that was fairly significant that had was given him that belonged to the founder of Boy Scouts in England, and it was a slim piece of wood and. That was taken and inserted into a electric pencil sharpener to till it was turned into shavings. Um, things like that happened. Okay. And I want to ask you about um, you know, any of Scott's medical problems. Can you can you tell us about any car accidents that you know of or times that well, when Scott, when Scott when Scott was really little, he was hospitalized a few times. Uh, he had really bad colic as a baby. Um, so that was an issue for him. Later on, uh, when he was maybe about seven, eight years old, I'm not quite sure, uh, someone came and knocked on a door yelling, a friend of his, saying that Scott had been hit by a car. And he had been on his bicycle, and we went running down to find him, and he was lying there on the side of the road and an ambulance eventually came and he was taken to the hospital. Um, he was released to go home later that night, but okay. as a, he was laying the road. Do you know of any substance abuse issues that Scott suffered in his teens and 20s? Um, yeah. Uh, I myself smoked pot with Scott. What? And... Uh, can you tell me when that was or how old Scott was? Scott was probably about 14, and I was probably 19. And uh, I did it, I thought, as a way to bond with him in a sort, because he had come to stay at the apartment I was living in, and uh, he wasn't able to stay at my father's then, and there may have been some issue going on with my mother, so he came and stayed over my house and... We listened to music, and for me, my thought at the time was that maybe... Your mother died in 2007, and that Scott was still incarcerated during that time? Yes, he was. And um, did you ever get to visit Scott in person while he was in prison? Scott, 
Scott made it clear that he did not want us to visit him in prison. Um, and specifically, he wrote me, his reasoning, at least at that time, was that he thought it would be too difficult to uh, say goodbye at the end of our visit together. Um, that it would be hard, too hard on him, and he didn't desire that to happen. So it did not occur. Was, do you, would it have been difficult for you to visit him anyway? Like, do you know uh, where he was housed? Financially, um, it would have been hard on me. I didn't have the money, really, uh, to go. Scott was uh, held in various So it wasn't something I would have been able to do to begin with. I mean, I would have made a concerted effort to try to do it at least once, but it never occurred. And so you never once got to visit Scott while he was in federal prison? Well, yeah, I did. I mean, he's my kid brother. I'm sorry. Yeah, did you, I did want to visit. Did you get to actually see him while he served his prison sentence? No, I never did. Uh, no. And did your mother ever get to see him while he was serving in prison? No. Um, I want to talk about... My brother Bob was against it, and some of my uh, family was not happy with it, but um, I wanted to hold the memorial service for my mother until such time as Scott had been released so that he could participate in it. Because okay. I'm sure my mother... I'm sorry, so he would have been released in 2008? Yes, that was, yeah. Okay, but I want to ask some questions more generally about the letters that you and Scott exchanged over his prison time. Sure. Um, did his letters, the tone of his letters change at some point? Yeah, initially Scott was explaining to me sort of what conditions were like or uh, what it was like to be in a prison. Um, and, and often he would talk about how he intended to change his life when he got out. Uh, and he was, you know, he, of course, regretted being there. Uh, some plans for himself in the future as to what, uh, the future might hold for him as far as securing some type of employment, or finding a career or profession so in the was, future. So he was somewhat optimistic in, in in the beginning. Absolutely, yes, yeah. Did you feel like his plans or his dreams were unrealistic? Um, I thought Scott had the capability to do almost anything he wants to do. Um, however, I thought that some of the things, for instance, at one time he point, pointed out that he might like to uh, own a restaurant, manage a restaurant. And I, I absolutely could see him, and he has the capability to do that. My concern was, you know, you need to have the money to be able to do that. It's not uh, an easy thing to get into, and you need to secure a lot of finances. So that would concern me, that he wasn't being particularly realistic, but... You know, I guess you're in prison. You need to have some goal. Hopefully, you should have some kind of goal or plan for your future. And that was his at that time. And so did his correspondence at some point get less optimistic? Yes. Um, he began talking about how he had been put in segregation or something. and He couldn't, uh, wasn't able to do this or that. Or he wasn't wasn't feeling particularly well, that he had this kind of problem, and uh, he didn't feel he was getting, like, medical attention that he needed. Um, so he, he sounded more and more depressed as time went on. Uh, uh, and then there was, a, after a period of time, a tone of anger in some of his letters and that uh, nobody, you know, really understands what's going on here. Uh, and he would seek help from my mother and from myself 
in terms of uh, being able to send letters to uh, various uh, government officials, the prison board, and uh, things like that. And he would include all the information and the addresses of these people wanting us to uh, write to them. And I know my mother did on occasion, and I, I certainly did several times. But uh, it became something that he really wanted help. He felt that he needed something else as far as some type of treatment or something while he was there. Okay. And so your father died in 2010, is that right? Yes. And did you later learn that... I'm sure it sort of has... I'm sorry, Mr. Nelson. Let me just ask the next question. Did you later learn that your father had written you and your brothers out of his will and gave everything to his wife and stepsons? I was hesitant to say when my father died because I wasn't notified that my father had been in hospice, that he had been ill, uh, that he was dying. Uh, I hadn't found out that he had died and been buried. The only way I found out is they wrote a small article in the newspaper in Massachusetts that my mother's sister happened to see and she notified me to let me know that my father had died. So that's how I found out he died. Okay. Um, and so you were later sure. on. Uh, I'm sorry. No, and to, and to this day, to this day, I don't know how he died. I don't know where he's buried. Um, you know, I've asked this information, but it's never been provided me. And when he passed away, uh, Neither myself or my brothers apparently were mentioned in his will. But uh, his second wife's children were, were probably Scott's age. Okay. They were left whatever they were left. Okay. okay. And um, Your Honor, at this time I have defense, what's been marked as, for identification as I. Um, I would seek to enter into evidence as defense five. No. I'm sorry. No objection. That objection has been marked for identification as defense I is admitted into the exhibit pit. Ended into evidence as Defendant's Exhibit 5. And I'd also show the state Defense G that I would seek to admit into evidence as Defense 6. Okay. That objection has been marked for identification as Defendant's G is admitted into evidence as Defendant's Exhibit 6. into evidence at this time. Defense J. All right, what's been marked for identification as Defense J is admitted into evidence as Defendant's Exhibit 7. Now, Mr. Nelson, you um, did not correspond with Scott Nelson during his last prison stint between 2010 and 2017. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And through this video is the first time that you've seen Scott since at least 2000. I, I haven't seen Scott in over 25 years. Seeing him in this video is the first time I've seen him in 
25 years. Um, I don't have any other questions, Judge. Thank you. Cross-examination. Good morning, Mr. Nelson. Good morning, sir. I believe you said that Scott was your father's favorite. Is that correct? We believe that because my brother and I believe that because he had most of my father's attention all the time. And we were glad to see that we thought that he was the favorite simply because it was better than the position that my brother Bob and I were, that we were ever jealous about it. We were happy for him. And Scott got all kinds of attention, didn't he? From your father. I think it was more that Scott sought the attention and that my brother Bob and I had given up than my, that my father gave it to him. Your father bought Scott a recliner so they could watch baseball on television together, didn't he? Yes, he did. And your father bought Scott Nelson, Your Honor, if I may use given names for purposes of clarity. Yes. Your father bought Scott Nelson Italian mini bikes, didn't he? Yes, that's true. In fact, your father took Scott to the Winter Olympics when they were when they took place in Canada, while you, the family was living in either Massachusetts or Vermont or New Hampshire, right? Yes, that's correct. Do you recall what year that was? Mm, no, I do. frankly, I don't. It was perhaps in the 80s. So after your parents were divorced? Oh, no, they were still married. No, Scott's life changed completely after the divorce. He never would have experienced any of those things after the divorce. And that's part of what made it really difficult. Okay, so the Winter Olympics that your father and Scott attended took place prior to your parents' divorce? Yes, yeah, because my mother went with them. The three of them went. Scott was a hard worker, wasn't he? Scott was an extremely hard worker. Scott was always... Uh, anytime you need something done... Sir, I'm sorry, you're going to have to repeat the last part of your answer. I didn't hear what you said. It went out, I guess. Could you repeat what you had asked? Scott was always looking for work, wasn't he? Yes, he did. He always worked. Yep, that's true. Scott was self-sufficient, wasn't he? He most certainly was, yes. In fact, Scott would do things for other people and not ask for anything in return, wouldn't he? That's correct. And Scott would follow through on things that he started, wouldn't he? Yes, he certainly did. He spent a fair amount of time with his father, didn't he? Well, yes, he did. Okay, now let's uh, let's talk about uh, the the store in Danbury, and that's Vermont, right? Or is that New Hampshire? New Hampshire. Okay. I believe you said that. The fa you or your family owned that store for about a year and a half. Is that right? Or yes. Year okay. and a half, two years. Okay, and 
you said that you graduated from high school in 1973 and the family moved to Danbury the next week. Is that right? That's correct. Now, how long did you stay in Danbury after the move to that city in 1973? I stayed there until the end of, that was in June, till the end of August of that year. And then I returned to Massachusetts. Then you returned to Massachusetts? Yes, until December of that year. Okay. So Scott was about nine or ten at this time? I would think so, yes. Do you know if Scott attended school in Danbury? Yes, he did. Now, you talked about one or more um, apartments that your mother lived in. Mm -hmm. When was this? When in time was this? I wasn't clear when all this was taking place. Uh, following the divorce, they moved from the custom home in Candia. They lived in a trailer. After that, um, after the trailer, they moved to an apartment in Concord, New Hampshire. They lived there for a while, and uh, while living there, uh, Scott was incarcerated, and my mother went on to live in another apartment by herself. Okay, you said that they moved to an apartment. By they, do you mean your mother and Scott? Yes, that's right. How long did your mother and Scott live in the trailer that you had previously described? Hmm. Maybe four or five years. I, I'm really not certain. I uh, only visited them, and I, you know, didn't live with them, so I'm really not sh exactly sure. You said that your mother was employed by the Department of Motor Vehicles. I believe you called it something different. Um, A registry of motor vehicles. Okay. Yes. Same thing. Yes. Okay, and w that was in New Hampshire. Yes, in Concord, New Hampshire. Okay. When did your mother start working for the New Hampshire Registry of Motor Vehicles? Maybe 1976, 77. So not too long after your parents divorced. No. Oh, yes, I, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Yes, it was after my parents were divorced, my mother started working for the registry. Yes, that's correct. So she went to work relatively shortly after the divorce, didn't she? Oh, you talked about uh, uh, smoking marijuana with your brother when he was 14. That's right. Okay, and you said that you were 19 at the time, right? Yes, I was. And you had your own apartment then, right? Yes, I did. And you were giving your brother, who was 14, marijuana in an effort to bond with your brother, weren't you? Yes, I smoked a joint, a marijuana cigarette with my brother. Yes, I did. And that was to be a bonding experience. It was sort of because of all the other rotten things that were happening in his life. Uh, it was a chance for us to sit and talk that things necessarily, necessarily weren't going to be as bad with my mother and my father and that things could get better in his life, yes. And I believe you said everybody loved your mother, didn't they? 
They absolutely did. You said she had a wonderful sense of humor. She had a great sense of humor, yes. Now, you said that Scott has an, a drinking problem. I believe he did, yes. That's what you think? That's yes, opinion. that's what I believe. You said that Scott did an awful lot around the trailer that your, that your mother and Scott lived in right following the divorce. He was responsible for Yes, he certainly Go ahead. He certainly did. He did everything from electrical things to stuff with the heating, uh, appliance repairs. He did yard, the yard work, uh, washed the car. He did it all. He gave your mother money. Didn't he? I'm sorry, could you repeat that, please? He would earn money and give it to your mother, wouldn't he? Uh, he yes, he would. When he earned some, he was uh, willing, uh, willingly would give her money to help towards groceries or whatever. That wasn't a very materialistic person. He didn't require a lot at that age. Sir, let me ask you this. You do not have a criminal history, do you? I'm sorry, sir, that it went out again. I can't understand you. You do not have a criminal history, do you? Yes, I do. What is it? I was arrested for marijuana. Lot, sir. Council for. My objection's been sustained. Okay, hey, Mr. Nelson, let me ask it this way. You have never been convicted of a felony or a misdemeanor involving moral turpitude, have you? Same objection, Your Honor. No, sir. Oh, sir, hold on. Counsel Crook. Are the objections sustained? The motion to strike the most latest statement from the witness is granted. If I can have a moment to consult, Your Honor. Yes. Okay, Mr. Nelson, um, let's go back to talking about the Olympics for a minute, okay? Okay. The Winter Olympics, are you sure that the Winter Olympics were in Canada or were they somewhere else? Or did I get yeah, I don't know that they were. I thought they were the Summer Olympics and they were held in Montreal. The I'm summer? not sure what. You, I believe so. I wasn't part of that trip. I didn't live at home then. And I'm not particularly interested in the Olympics, whether it's summer or winter. But I do know for certainty that it was held in Montreal. Was that the Summer Olympics? Or the I believe Olympics? it. As I said, I'm not interested in the Olympics. I don't know. I didn't participate in that trip, but I believe it was the Summer Olympics. Now, you mentioned more than once that... Scott was incarcerated in 1994. And I don't know. Sir? Yes. 
What was Scott incarcerated for in 1994? I'm not sure of the date, but it had to do... Uh oh sir. Brown. All right, objections overruled. Go ahead. Mr. Nelson, is the connection still working well for you? Yes, it's fine now. Thank you. You said on direct testimony that Scott, your brother, was incarcerated in 1994. How long was he incarcerated? I believe it was 14 years. That was a federal sentence, wasn't it? Yes, I believe so. What do you understand the facts leading to that sentence to be? Objection to lack of personal knowledge. Overruled. Do you need me to repeat the question, sir? Oh, I thought I heard overruled so that I wasn't supposed to say anything. Um, yeah, would you repeat the question, please? I'm sorry. What do you understand to be the facts of the crime or crimes that led to your brother's incarceration for 14 years in 1994? Um, oh, my understanding was that my brother had gone uh, to my first home, asked if he could stay there, and my father denied him that I'm sorry, sir. <clears throat> and then he then you. asked sir. if my, was... let me get you to start over right when you started talking the system buffered and you broke up can you start over with your explanation of what you understand the facts yes <clears throat> yes uh, my understanding of it was that uh, my brother <clears throat> excuse me. My brother had gone to my father's. <clears throat> excuse me. My brother had gone to my father's home, and asked if he could stay stay there for a little while. My father denied him that. My father had lots of camping equipment, which Scott was aware of. That Scott then asked, "Well, could I borrow a tent and I'll sleep in the woods?" And my father said, "No, go away." Um, and following that, I guess at some point, the, uh, the next day or how many days afterwards, <clears throat> Scott returned there, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, forced my father to go to the bank and withdraw money. Do you know how much money? I've heard... It was $10,000, but I've heard that within the last couple weeks. Uh, prior to that, I never knew. And the victim in this case was your father, wasn't he? I'm sorry, sir. It broke up again. It broke up again, but I believe your question, you were asking me who the victim was, and that was my father? You said that Scott forced your father to go to the bank. How did he force him? Yes. How did Scott force your father to go to the bank? I'll sustain the objection. Do you know how your father father was forced to go to the bank by Scott? Uh, I'm not sure. I know, I guess he drove him there. Do you know how Scott forced your father to drive him to the bank? Objection. 
objection? Again, I'll repeat, I'll repeat myself and say I, was, I wasn't there. Mr. Nelson, Mr. James Nelson, I sustain the objection. Can I have one moment, Your Honor? Yes. No further questions of this witness, Your Honor. Redirect. One moment, Your Honor. Yes. All right, Mr. James Nelson, we are going to uh, disconnect now, sir. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, sir. Counsel approach. All right, members of the jury, in just a moment, we're going to take our lunch recess. Uh, during the lunch recess, you're going to continue to leave your notepads and your pens here during the lunch recess. You remain under all the court's instructions, including but not limited to the instruction not to discuss this case amongst yourselves or with anyone else. We plan to continue the presentation of the evidence at 1.30 p.m. this afternoon, so just follow the deputy's instructions where you need to be. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you for your service this morning. We'll see you at 1.30. All right, Ms. Moore, the court did have the opportunity after we went into recess yesterday to uh, read the Davis case that was uh, cited in the defense motion to reconsider, uh, as well as the Florida Supreme Court decision of uh, FAM v. State that was also cited in the motion. Um, after reviewing those authorities uh, in close detail, uh, the court is denying the motion to reconsider uh, you had prepared a proposed blank order that I've just filled in with denied, and that's going to be filed with Madam Clerk. Thank you. All right, anything else from the defense before we go into lunch recess? No, Your Honor. Anything else from the state? No, Your Honor. Mr. Nelson, anything else before lunch recess? No, sir. All right, we will be in lunch recess till 1.30 p.m. this afternoon. You all have a nice lunch. <laughs>